showing nothing has changed. Closest right. approach to the Earth still is going to be October 16th at 1950 hours GMT, which is a crucial moment in time, which is the key to uncoding all of what Eleni is supposed to be doing here, which we don't know yet. So Richard, Richard, I have, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have someone else ask you a question, okay? By all means. Larry? Yeah, I'm here. Do you have a question? Could you ask a question, pointed question, for Mr. Hoagland? Yeah, sure. I just want to say thanks for having me, Francis, and it's nice to meet you, Mr. Hoagland. Nice here. You're my welcome. Question, my question is, Is do you think Elenin is a threat to Earth, and if it is, what kind of threat? Absolutely not. And the reason is the numbers. The bottom line is I'm going to be presenting at the Awaken Alert Conference in just a week from tomorrow night is that the overwhelming message of Elamine is these numbers, which are hyperdimensional torsion field physics numbers. The message of Elamine, which is inherent in its very trajectory and in its tetrahedral geometry, as Francis and I were discussing a moment ago, is the physics. If the physics was made public, if it was brought out of the black objects and black you know, ops realm and made public, it would solve our energy crisis, it would solve environmental problems, it would solve poverty on earth, it would make oceans, you know, desalinize, it would cause deserts to bloom, it would be the, the keys to a humane living on earth for seven billion human beings. This object is coming into the inner solar system advertising this is the physics. So its very message is enlightening and free. And so I don't view it as a threat at all, except to the people who have us in slavery, the banksters and politicians, and you can just name that, go down the list yourself. Those people should be terrified, cowering in their boots, that what Elenine is going to do is pull the veil off and reveal the real science of space and space travel and access to energy that would turn the earth into a, into a garden again. And so, yes, that group of people have a lot to fear, but it's not physical. It's the enlightenment of a huge paradigm change if the numbers on melanin are for real, and they are. Envy, thank you, Richard. Envy, do you have a follow-up question? No, he answered it perfectly. Thanks. Thank you. Energy, uh, do you have a question for Mr. Hoagland? No, actually, I don't. Most of everything I had to uh, ask was already covered. Okay. Um, Richard, now, I have some other callers that w I was going to do this roundtable, and everybody's going to have a few minutes to speak. I'm wondering, do you have something to say that you hadn't had a chance to say, some kind of, you know, ice cream on top of the cone? Because I know that one of my images, the uh, near-infrared image, image, really kind of gave you some, you know, some hard proof that said, hey, this is really looking more like the tetrahedron shield because of the shape that appeared in that image. A spectacular, on the edge of your seat thing you did, Francis, as I kept looking on your site, when's he going to take another picture? When's he going to take another picture? And nothing happened, and nothing happened, and nothing happened. And then, of course, it's now, I believe, invisible from anybody on Earth. And the next image we're going to get will be from Soho, and God knows if they're going to tinker with that one let us see what's really there. I mean, again, that's a NASA spacecraft, and they are not being very honest on a whole range of things. The only thing they can't lie to everybody about is the trajectory, because if they did that, then nobody could find it, and there'd be all hell to pay when someone found out that those numbers had been altered. So the numbers themselves are absolutely verifiable through independent people like yourself. I'm just tickled to death because you and I had never talked. I don't know whether you even saw what I had done with the stereo B imagery when I discovered this tetrahedral shield around the uh, around Alanine itself several days before. But when you popped out with that infrared image, uh, and I looked up where the passion lines are, it was crystal clear that it's the recombining of hydrogen against this shield that makes it visible in your IR image. So, I mean, let's hear it for real science. Thank you very much. Uh, now, Richard, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to speak with Ian Musgrave because he's, he's in the panel right now. My only issue with Ian is that he cannot hear me. I have to type a question, and then Ian's going to speak. 
So we're going to try to go ahead and do this because I, he, he's been gracious enough to come to the panel. And then, Richard, if you have a question, please think of a question. And after, he's, after I'm done asking him to answer questions, we can ask him questions, okay? Okay. Okay, Ian. Ian fixed the problem, Francis. He, set, uh, he's, uh, he fixed it, I believe. Ian, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Uh, the um, the voice was going to Dev Null. Okay, that is wonderful that you can hear me. Now, Ian, I want to ask you, because I know that you've been taking pictures and have been following the comet along with me and along with all of us who are at the table, right? Yep. Can you give me a three-minute explanation from you, your viewpoint about Comet Elenin? Um, in, in, in what sense would you like to have a, a, an explanation? Okay. Of, of well, an explanation I'm, because... Well, uh, all I can talk about is what we know from uh, my observations, the observation of Leonard Ellen himself and Michael Mazziano, uh, the southern astronomers who've been following the comet. Um, but uh, I can ask you pointed so, questions. Let me go ahead and ask yeah. you some questions because I, I yeah. have some in, in, in mind. Ian, you now you and Leonard and Michael have been looking at Michael's images, right? Uh, Mike, Mike, Mike Mazziano, yes, we've been uh, watching his images um, with quite with uh, great interest. He, he's he's uh, with, um, you may or may not know this, but I I'm, uh, uh, have a, a, a account on global winter scope, and I've got some solid uh, telescope images. But the problem with a lot of tel a lot of the automated telescopes is you can't get down very low to the horizon. Uh, Michael's uh, very lucky; he's got uh, his own telescopes able to get very low to the horizon. The problem with uh, with Ellen at the moment, and it's now not visible anymore, is that it's very it's uh, coming very close uh, to the sun. So all our images are in the uh, in the twilight. So it's very very difficult to get images unless you can get your telescope pointing very close to the, to the uh, uh, sun. So his images are very poor. I've been following Ellen in the stereo uh, spacecraft images. And so uh, they have, a, have different sorts of problems. For example, Michael's images are very high, um, uh, high magnification images, whereas the stereo image, stereo's got a very wide field of view. It's like looking at it through uh, 30 by binoculars, so you won't see the same sort of detail. Ian, is the comet broken up, in your opinion? Uh, very definitely so. If you uh, compare the images coming from uh, Michael's uh, site and also the images from uh, 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 one of the other southern astronomers to the images of Comet uh, 1999 S4, it's uh, ta uh, taken with similar scale um, uh, telescopes. You see exactly the same thing. The uh, nucleus starts elongating, then fading and dissipating. So, but when we talk about breaking up, uh, the question is whether or not uh, it's, it's very it's very obviously uh, breaking up. But the question is, is it breaking up like Comet 73P, where you have a still have a large chunk that's behind and a trail of smaller pieces which are evaporating, or was it breaking up like Comet 1999 S4, where it just turned into gravel and uh, vaporised? Uh, at the I moment, sorry. No, go ahead. If you if you had another statement, I, I'm still waiting. I have another question. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. So uh, at the moment, it's uh, uh, the comet's moved out of the H1B uh, imager and it's now in the H1A imager uh, of the stereo spacecraft, and uh, we're getting a view from the stereo uh, from stereo A, which is similar to the view to be seen from Earth in terms of magnitude. Uh, and uh, at the moment, the comet's about uh, magnitude 11 or 12, so it's faded quite substantially. Now, it's just past perihelion, and it should be effectively at its brightest. So it's been doing exactly the opposite of what uh, the comets normally do when they remain intact, which is get brighter at uh, 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 just around perihelion. It's, in fact, got much fainter. It's gone, gone from about magnitude 8 to uh, running around at about magnitude uh, 10, or, uh, 10 or 11, depending on... Uh, how you calibrate the images from stereo. Okay, that's a, a great description of what your, you know, how you see the comet from your viewpoint as the astronomical, the astro astronomer, and you. And, and then I wanted to ask you a question because I know that Michael started reporting that the breakup occurred, you know, August 26th, August 22nd. 
I have a question, a point of one. Is it possible for me to take a picture on September 2nd with some narrow band filters and a solid circular nucleus show up? Uh, there's, a, there's a number of number ways this can happen. Uh, for example, it, it, starts, it, uh, it starts breaking up around about, uh, uh, so it, it breaks up somewhere between the, uh, 20, uh, the, the 20th, when is the, we've got the last decent images, and the uh, 22nd, 23rd. We, uh, again, the question is whether it's breaking up uh, like uh, 73P, where you still have a large chunk uh, with lots of little bits coming off, or whether it's uh, doing, going to gravel like 1990S4. Now, uh, again, when you're looking at uh, when, you, when you're uh, looking at this thing through a range of filters, um, it depends. Uh, what we use, uh, use filters for is to try and improve contrast with the uh, background sky for comets. Comets are faint, fuzzies. Uh, we tend to use things uh, like the swan filters, which uh, let through the light from oxygen and carbon in the comet's tail uh, fluorescing. So um, what you could probably see uh, is uh, you might be able to see a central condensation, but whether or not you're actually seeing the nucleus is another thing entirely. Um, so uh, you, uh, you, could be see you could be seeing some sort of central condensation, but that might be coma around uh, a, a, a number of chunks that are still there. Again, if it's a 73P model, you uh, could have a uh, like, uh, Elements roughly was roughly about three to four kilometres across. You could still have about a one kilometre chunk left, and the rest has been turned into a hundred kilometre, a hundred metre, uh, and twenty metre chunks, which are rapidly evaporating. But unless we have a really high quality telescope, you're not going to pick out those chunks. That, to me, uh, that, that's so depressing. I, I, I really wanted it, you know. Plus, with my pictures, I'm holding on to it's still intact. But you know, I can I, I must listen to you and, and understand it from a little bit from your viewpoint. But I'm going to keep praying that it's together until it comes out. And I know that some people still think it's together, and and they even if they look at images, they'll still think it's together. So between me and you, Ian, I hope it's together. But I, I hear what you're saying, and I've seen Michael's images, so it would be an easy interpretation to get that. Um, interpretation from looking at his photos. I sent m copies of my photos to Leonid, and he's had them now for about 10 or 12 days, and he really hasn't reported on them. So, And I wasn't able to get new images from Australia in Victoria because the weather has just been bad. So, <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. One second, Ian. Can you repeat that, caller? Can I jump in and ask a question? This is Hoagland. Yes, Richard, yes. You can ask, Ian, Richard's going to ask a question. We're going to have a couple questions for you, Ian, starting with Richard. Okay, go ahead. Ian, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you on your website. Nice to have a place to go where you can get uncensored information on a lot of in interesting things going on out there. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, uh, and all Celestia fans will just put up a Celestia file for the uh, tattooing like planet we've just got from Kepler. Yeah, now you're breaking up a little bit, so you might want to look at your phone if you're on a portable. Here's my question. When back in the, in the um, um, 70s, when I was at the Hayden Planetarium, we had a major comet event called Comet Kohotek. Boy, did we build that up. All the mainstream, all the networks, all the major observatories, there was Kohotek mania. And I wound up chartering a ship which was the QE2, and taking her to South America so we could get a view from the upper decks at night.